Ethan, the last time we had you on the show, you said to be prepared for a war on nicotine, the same level of war against drugs. Two years later, what do you see? Well, it seems, I think this longer term trend, right? I, 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 there's a part of me that thinks that the case for harm reduction products is so persuasive that it's going to continue to make ground, right? Two years ago, we were dealing with these local bans. Those are going to continue. It's going to keep happening. Yet here we are sitting at the end of October, and the FDA has just given a quasi green light to allow the sale of its first e cigarette. That's a little breakthrough, and that follows on them giving a quasi green light to uh, ICOS and SNUS not long ago. So I feel that the the, the future of harm reduction products is going to be complicated, um, uh, but I feel somewhat optimistic. And the evidence and the arguments are so overwhelmingly in favor of harm reduction and alternatives to combustible cigarettes. Where I worry somewhat is what's going to happen with cigarettes. Because even within the harm reduction community, there's a notion that we need to move in the direction of essentially prohibiting real cigarettes, right? By stripping them of the nicotine, by making the restrictions. And, and my fear there is if one moves too quickly in the way of banning these things, cracking down on these things, um, we risk inciting a real black market that is at a level we've not really seen before. When you come out of working in the illegal drug policy era, you know all about black markets and you know, international crime syndicates and massive violence, crime and corruption you know, throughout the world. And I think in the tobacco control and even the tobacco harm reduction part of the tobacco control world, you know, everybody knows there's this black market in cigarettes that's worth billions of dollars a year around the world. But it's not seen and maybe is not quite yet that violent or dangerous. But if we go towards actively stripping cigarettes of their nicotine, effectively banning them. It's like it would be like limiting marijuana to less than 0.5% THC. I think you're going to see a, an explosion in the black market with criminal organizations, with violence, with corruption, unlike anything we've seen before. And I worry about that. Yeah. Well, and for members of our audience who don't know, I mean, you really have been credited for leading the war against the war on drugs. Well, I mean, I spent 30 years working on this issue. You know, it was building a movement with a lot of other good people as well. But I'd say if I look back, I mean, obviously our success on marijuana reform was really pivotal. I mean, you know, when I got going in the 80s, I think we had 25% of the population, you know, was in favor of legalizing marijuana and it wasn't legal for anything anywhere. And now I look back now, you know, and you see, you know, was it 90% of Americans say marijuana should be legal for medical purposes, 60, 65% say it should be legal across, you know, for, for all adults, even a majority in some surveys of Republicans and certainly young Republicans favor it. And medical marijuana is now legal in two thirds of the states and marijuana in over for all adults in over one third of the states. So that was a monumental transition. Probably the only thing analogous in U.S. politics over the last generation or two has been the evolution with respect to gay rights and gay marriage, right? Um, on the other drugs, I feel we've made progress. I mean, you know, ending, they're you know, trying to reduce mass incarceration and particularly stripping the drug war piece out of it. And on illicit drug harm reduction with needle exchange programs, overdose prevention, making the naloxone available, the, the, you know, the antidote for an overdose. I think there's been some very substantial progress, but unfortunately a long way to go. And I did want to ask you about that because it appears that harm reduction as a policy is not resonating with the public when it comes to tobacco. Is that because it may be uh, that it's so linked to the harder drugs and some of these other issues that people can't get their heads around harm reduction when it comes to cigarettes? Well, I, I think, I mean, even just five, six years ago, a majority of Americans said that, yeah, e-cigarettes are probably safer than cigarettes. Good thing to switch if you can't quit. But the more recent polls show the opposite, right? That a majority of Americans believe that e-cigarettes are as or more dangerous than combustible cigarettes, which is absurd. A majority of Americans believe that nicotine is what causes cancer, right? They don't get that it's a smoking part of it. And even in some surveys, a majority of physicians believe that nicotine is the really you know, harmful substance here, as opposed to just being the one that causes dependence. And so I think that incredible amount of misinformation that has been really encouraged and propagated both by the government, the CDC, the sort of, you know, Surgeon General, which has been, you know, just not true to the science here. And then unfortunately, the role of Michael Bloomberg, 
I mean, here you have one of the wealthiest people, not just in America, but the world, I think one of the top 10 in the world, um, who has basically, you know, gave $160 million a couple years ago to ban vaping and who is not well informed, who seems to be captive to the real, you know, prohibitionist types on tobacco control and the abstinence only folks. I know what they look like from my illicit drug area. So I think there's been this massive miseducation effort. When that whole thing with the Valley, right, it happened a few years ago, the, um, you know, where people were laying up in a hospital and like 50 or 60 people died and thousands were hospitalized because of these, uh, because they were vaping. And it just made no sense that it would be about e-cigarettes, right? It, it had to be something else. And early on, some smart journalists pointed out this almost certainly had to do with a few knuckleheads who were making marijuana vape and they were putting a vitamin E acetate in it, which was safe to consume orally, but not to light up, not to burn. And yet the CDC named the disease E-Valley, e-cigarette. I mean, it was a deliberate obfuscation. And they still are not ready to really back away from these false claims. So when you have that sort of government propaganda backed by an incredibly wealthy philanthropist putting real money behind that, I mean, I dealt with this in the early days of, days of drug policy reform, where you had, you know, some of the one of the biggest, you know, some of the biggest foundations were like all about, you know, anti-marijuana, anti-harm reduction, anti-everything. The government was there, so I think that's played a major, major role. I think there's a few other elements here, which is that. There's a class dimension to this thing. You know, the parents, by and large, who've been freaking out about their teens, you know, using e-cigarettes, jeweling, et cetera, by and large are middle, upper middle class, largely white parents who either never smoke cigarettes or haven't in a very long time. They don't, they listen to the miseducation about, about e-cigarettes being as dangerous or more dangerous than cigarettes, and they're freaked out about you know their teenagers getting caught up in this, and some of those teenagers will in fact have a hard time quitting e-cigarettes, right? Meanwhile, they don't know anybody who uses e-cigarettes, or they don't think they know, because it may well be the plumber, the carpenter, the gardener, the whatever do it, but those people don't do it in front of them. They're the employer, right? So they don't get to see people who are really using these sorts of things. So we have a real class split on this stuff as well. Right. I mean, you know, look where the big numbers are on vaping. It's among, you know, people with suffering with mental illness, people involved in the more serious illicit drug use area, uh, veterans, uh, uh, you know, lower middle class uh, white people. Right. Or people living in parts of the country, not in the big city. So I think there's just a real lack of empathy and concern for the 35 to 40 million Americans who are smoking, many of whom would quit or try to quit with vaping devices and other tobacco harm reduction devices if they really knew the evidence. The problem is even many smokers don't know that these things are healthier, or even if they do, their kids or their spouses don't know. So, you know, I mean, if everybody knew that you could dramatically reduce, reduce the risk of tobacco nicotine by switching from cigarettes to these other things, right, and that that even might be an avenue towards stopping everything altogether, well, I think we would see a major transition. But that would require the government being honest, and that would require Michael Bloomberg seeing the light, and it also requires another philanthropist yet to be identified or recruited who would support the cause of tobacco harm reduction without having any connections to big tobacco. Now, isn't there somebody out there that you might know? You might know? Unfortunately, no. You know, I mean, you know, George Soros played a pivotal role in, uh, you know, my work on drug policy reform. But you know, he was the sole funder for many years in the late '90s and, and into the into the early 2000s. It took a real long time before anybody else came on board. And now, you know, he's 91, and his priorities are more broadly elsewhere. Um, I've tried with a few others without success so far. And let me ask you this, because it seems to me that. Many of the people who say were your allies, allies to the war on drugs, seem to not be allies when it comes to tobacco harm reduction. Well, it's interesting. You know, if I look at the folks who are involved in drug policy reform and other, you know, Ill illicit drug harm reduction efforts, a lot of them, they get the principle. And they get the principle that it applies to tobacco as well. And so if you ask, well, why aren't they jumping on board here? I think one is the fact that it's just these are organizations with very little funding. It's a matter of priorities. There's still a big drug war still going out there and still hundreds of 
of people behind bars, and you know, so so it's just hard to put this as a priority. And you know, my argument to them is, look, here's where we're sliding into criminalization. And you know, one of my incentives was I'll be damned if have to, ever, after having spent much of my adult life working toward to ending the criminalization and demonization and stigmatization of cannabis and other drugs, I'm going to you know, finish off by seeing a new drug war focused on tobacco and nicotine products. I think the second factor is that you sometimes get, you know, many organizations are more to the left. I mean, even my own politics are somewhat center left. My staff would be even more to the left. And I think there's a kind of uh, anti-big capital, anti-multinational. And let's face it, big tobacco, you know, you know, it's, you know, given the venality of its, what it did throughout the 20th century into the 21st and even continuing to do that, people, the fact that this in any way is associated with big tobacco, that it might benefit them which it would because now some of them are seeing their interest in tobacco harm reduction. I think that's really, you know, they're, they're wary. It's showing up at a meeting where any, anybody might have the slightest taint of any bit of funding from big tobacco. I think the third piece is that in illicit drug harm reduction and drug policy, there's a big focus now, especially in the U.S., on the racial justice piece, which makes a lot of sense given the extent to which the war on drugs has been disproportionately and overwhelmingly focused on people of color and especially black people. But the fact that the whole debate in tobacco and tobacco harm reduction does not yet have a major racial justice dimension. When it emerged on the issue of banning mentholated cigarettes, you saw the black community split right, between the, the black public health organizations and many of the politicians, you know, being in favor of a ban from a, what they saw as a public health perspective, and the black and allied civil rights organizations being against the ban because they knew this would lead to criminalization and arrest as it had with marijuana and other illicit drugs, right? But I think in this tobacco harm reduction area, you don't have much uptake of e-cigarettes among black youth as yet. It's disproportionately, I think, white youth, right? And so therefore, for, you know, there's that, there's that very interesting study that, was, that somebody did a few years ago where they looked in the garbage containers in different high schools. And what they found in the white high schools, especially, you know, were basically, you know, uh, disposable e-cigarettes and things like that. And what you found in the, in the high schools where it was more black and brown kids was you found, you know, the, you know, like cigarette papers and things like that. So this is not an issue that's played out there. Now, mind you, about a year ago, there was a situation where the cops, I think some black kids were walking down a, a boardwalk or something in Maryland, and one of them was vaping, and the cops said, you know, put that down, stop it, and the kids kind of mouthed off and said, you know, leave us alone, and one of them got arrested, and that went, you know, somewhat viral. So that, it, you know, the, I mean, it's, hard, it's tragic to say it, but the more that, that black youth are perceived as victims on the war on tobacco and vaping, the more that progressive-minded organizations will begin to own this issue as well. And that's just the nature of the politics of it right now. You know? it's, I mean, it's sad. It's strange, it's sad. I, I, I catch a lot of anti-colonialism, obviously, out there. And I think that the war against tobacco comes from the fact that, you know, we kind of stole, you know, the North American natives' uh, uh, peace drug and then used it to then take over the world. Right, because tobacco money really did that, right? And some of the first slaves were brought to the America mm -hmm. for tobacco. I'm just always wonder a little bit whether or not if there's some real deep anti-colonial stuff that's wrapped up in the battle against tobacco. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's so complicated. And when people come up for you know the sort of anti-colonial aspects to this, I'm not exactly sure even what that fully means now. I mean, you know, we know with tobacco, it has a long history as being used among Native Americans, both North and South America, going back way before, you know, West, you know, Europeans came and brought it into Europe and the rest of the world. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think it's more about of all the big multinationals, of all the big multinationals, um, you know, big tobacco really earned a reputation as being the most venal of them all. I mean, basically selling cancer sticks where, you know, if you keep smoking, you know, 50% chance of dying from it, you know, after a certain age. So, so you know, and, and where there was obvious incentives to recruit younger youth. So they did that. And even now, where some of the companies, you know, I think PMI, uh, uh, was it British Tobacco or whatever, British American Tobacco, um, 
you know, you see them now both continuing to sell cigarettes and selling, you know, increasing e-cigarettes or ICOs things or things like that. But ultimately, these are for-profit companies. They are public companies that have to answer to their shareholders. They operate in competitive environments. And so, you know, I think that their commitment to move towards harm reduction is mostly sincere, but that's tempered by the fact that they're in a competitive capitalist environment with shareholders and, you know, all this sort of stuff. It's why one needs companies like Juul was before it sold a huge part of itself to Altria or what Enjoy is. I think it's the largest now of the pure, you know, e-cigarette companies that's not owned by big tobacco. They play a role like Tesla does vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the big auto companies, right? You know, you ultimately down the road, you need both the disruptive companies that want to put big tobacco out of business, right? And then you need the big tobacco like big auto deciding that, hey, it's in our interest to get into electric cars. It's in our interest to get into um, non-combustible things. So we need that creative dynamic, but the role of government should be to incentivize that transition as rapidly as possible. It should be to be taxing both the manufacturers and the consumers in a way which favors the non-combustibles over the combustibles. I look at these proposals in Congress and the state level, and I think you're dealing with it in Canada as well, where they want to tax them equally. And I'm thinking, that's madness. That's madness. I mean, we effectively have tobacco policy in the country, to use an analogy from my area, where we're treating illegal street, you know, uh, you know uh, adulterated heroin or street fentanyl, the same under our laws as we would pharmaceutical heroin, right? I mean, which makes no sense whatsoever. It's like treating, um, you know, uh, you know uh, Johnny Walker or, or, you know, typical wine the same as we would treat, you know, wine being made in a backyard still or being made with wood alcohol. I mean, it, why have a policy like that? that? That's madness. So, you know. Have we reached a point where, where government's the problem? And that almost, when you say that, I mean, could you ever imagine saying that? Because that used to. No, no, I mean, I mean, look, government can make things better and they can make things worse, right? Um, uh, you know, in the drug war, government was very much the problem. You know, one of the keys to my success in bringing together people from across the political spectrum to libertarians, non libertarian Republicans, to liberals, progressives, even far left was everybody understand the government was making drug policy worse, right? They were using the wrong approaches. They were driven by ideology. I mean, government was, you know, it was, now, now I'm not somebody, I'm not a libertarian libertarian who believes that government inevitably makes things worse. I think some areas they make things better. You know, if I look at the early years of food and drug control in the early 20th century, I think what government did in that case was, you know, they did good stuff on food safety and drug safety and working conditions and safety of food and all this sort of stuff. But the same people pushing for that also pushed for alcohol prohibition, a monumental mistake, right? And I'm generally sympathetic to liberals pushing for general, better, smarter regulations on environmental stuff and, and a whole host of areas making, pushing the companies make cars safer, roads safer. You know, that should be a role of the government because otherwise who's watching out for the common good? But then government gets caught up in an ideology and it lands up making things worse rather than better. And there's a little twist here too. Too. It's a fascinating one. I think it's David Sweener, your fellow Canadian, who pointed this out to me, which is that when you come out of a public health world, this is not just government, this is also academia, you tend to think public health is something that governments need to spend money on, right, to accomplish the better good. You know, we need to, even with illicit drugs, you know, we need to find ways so that, you know, poor people can get the medications they need and get access to treatment. It's, I believe in, you know, having some type of national health coverage and safety net, right, that this is a good role that government can play, right? But interestingly, with tobacco harm reduction, this is a disruptive innovation in technology being produced by the for-profit world, both by the little guys with their vape shops importing little materials from China and now with the big tobacco guys, right? And 
left to its own devices, the market is actually could be producing a pretty good result. The proper role of government should be to incentivize this transition. Not only to try to incentivize people to move from carbon-based energy to, you know, solar and wind and energy and stuff like that. Government can and should play a positive role through the creative use of taxation policy incentives, but they're not doing it. They're doing the opposite in this case. Maybe, so, yeah, maybe that comes down to they don't trust the market and they it's unfamiliar it's almost like what is it like 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 wait a second you mean public health doesn't really need to play an active role you know that that actually the market that the for-profit players are actually going to produce the good result here that's not typically the case in public health so it's an odd case where they don't quite trust it they don't like the way it looks and smells you know when they look objectively they realize it's actually producing a result they like but it's coming from a strange place so there's that sense of unfamiliarity as well that makes people in the public health world, the traditional public health world, a little nervous. And um, let me ask you this last question, your podcast. Tell us about that. Yeah. So, uh, well, you know, the podcast, I have, uh, this is what the, it looks like. So you can see this here. Yeah, no, it, it was, I, when I stopped running Drug Policy Alliance four years ago, that's what I thought I wanted to do. You know, it's, uh, you, you don't have to be any place, anytime. It's not like teaching a class or having a radio show. But, you know, I, I decided to take life easy, the right opportunity to pop up. But about a year and a half ago, a, a movie director um, who I'd known a little bit through my advocacy work, Darren Aronofsky, who made Requiem of a Dream, did Black Swan, did uh, you know The Wrestler, Noah, some pretty big movies. And he said, hey, Ethan, uh, I'm thinking of getting in the podcast business. You want to give this a go? How about doing a podcast on psychedelics? I said, no, I don't want to do it just on psychedelics. I want to do it on all drugs. He said, let's do it. So now, uh, you know, we're doing it. And we have a contract, or he has a contract with iHeart, which is one of the, probably the world's biggest, you know, distributor, apart from New York Times and NPR. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm working with a great team of people. And it's really on all drug subjects. So, you know, one week uh, it might be, uh, well, Clyde Bates from the tobacco harm reduction world. Another week it might be Andrew Weil, a pioneering thinker about drugs and integrative medicine. Then it might be Michael Pollan, who wrote the book about you know psychedelics, how to change your mind has made such a big impact. Then it might be somebody I'd never met before, like like the the, the well-known podcast host um, Dan Savage, the one about sex and relationships, or uh, or um, uh, Tim Ferriss, who's a big business columnist with an interest in psychedelics. Or it might be this Yale law professor um, uh, James Foreman, who wrote a Pulitzer Prize-winning book about. Um, um, you know, the, the war on drugs within the black community and the fights with there. Or the former president of Colombia, the country, who won the Nobel Peace Prize, Juan Manuel Santos, who's been an ally on this issue. So, um, or it just might be some longtime activist or some brilliant academic or journalist who's just written a book. So I I'm having a blast with it. It's re-engaging me in the whole issue, giving me a reason to read books and stay reacquainted and everything like that. And uh, I'm hoping it's going to go on for, you know, quite a while. I, I think it's developing a significant listenership, mostly in the U.S., but I keep hearing from people around the world who are into it as well. So, you know, tune in, Psychoactive, available on all the major platforms.